going on people welcome welcome to the black to life kickback your host jelani hashtag bracy the ceo of black to life man this is where we are having enriching and insightful conversation with members of our black community worldwide uh just want to share their insights on what it is to be black and how they feel about being black. And you know, what's the topic of the day? Everyone knows coronavirus. So we just want to talk to uh, some of our uh, black leaders, black entrepreneurs, uh, people that are out here doing positive things in the community. Just want to see how just living and being black is. So without further ado, man, we got our first guest. Gonna get him on right now. Here we go. This is Mr. Ramil Shabazz Parks. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing, fam? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm on my AirPods. Is- I can hear you. Okay, good. All right, we're good. Yeah, 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 cool. Yeah. All right, man. I ain't really do nothing but just uh, introduce what we was going to be talking about and just your name. So if you don't mind, take it away from here, man. All right. Hello, my name is Ramil Shabazz Parks. Uh, I'm the owner of Pan African Beauty Supply and Messiah Network, Um, teacher, uh, community leader uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth area. All right, cool, man. So uh, we're going to get right into it, uh, brother. All right. So the first intro question we like to ask, uh, just want to see the gauge of people. What is it like to be black or what does being black mean to you? Got you. All right. So it's a two-part question, man. Um, for me personally, being black is everything to me. I have always had a sense of like pride with my blackness. Uh, I remember growing up and kind of like, um, it's not really being taught. It was kind of like, you know, people were scared of the darker side. But, you know, as I got older, as I got more history with it, you understand that beauty for well, black beauty is like, you know, you can get somebody as dark as night or as light as day, still black, you know what I'm saying, still strong. So I always have, like, you know, a sense of pride with blackness. And there's, there's levels to it, too, because, you know, on an economic level, if you think about black people, people from all over the world that came to communities of blacks or into different countries of Africa to try to get our resources. And, you know, they say understand the, black, the importance of the black dollar. You know what I'm saying? If you think about on a political stance, the black vote is always a main topic. It's always a hot topic every year. It's time to vote. And people are, you know, trying to see how we can get the black vote. So, you know, being black, it's, it's levels to it. You know, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's a proper thing for me. So I look at it like, you know, some people take like offense. I'm like real proper with it, but I'm just, you know, black and happy to be about it. Yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, thank you for your uh, interpretation of that. And I, and I uh, you know, it's different levels, like you said, of being black. And one thing about it is you can't be afraid. Too black. exactly like exactly. there is no such thing as too black or you know you ain't measuring up to it it's like black is uh is not monolithic like you just spoke to it it's a it's a number of things so thank you for that man and that's uh, true because like you know if you think about it you have some people who kind of like you know they're proud of being black but they really don't want to stand into it but you know it goes different levels like you know i remember being in class until like you know like, i was at unt for a little bit and that's what i graduated from i remember being in class and being like the only black person in there uh, you know, being in high school, like, you know, different black topics are come up and you kind of like, oh, I got to touch on this today too. But, you know, you got to because it's like you're the only one there. So, you know, it's levels to being black. But one thing you can't be is scared because regardless of how it's going to happen, you're going to be black regardless. So you got to be proud of it. Yeah, true that. And to your point about, you know, growing up in school, like uh, it was a more of a conditioned mindset to be careful of your black. Mm-hmm. Like it wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily say it, but you knew like you probably just couldn't be that much black right and we need to get up out of that because uh we have to step into our fullness of being african people exactly. so there is no such thing as too much or too little like we're african people so we need to step into that and be uh not ashamed but actually embrace it and be proud and, and you know that's what we, in our ancestors we've learned that since the beginning like our ancestors have always been proud no matter what we've gone through uh times 
of the world's beginning uh, to present times, to times of slavery, or where, mm -hmm. when we were enslaved. We've always been a prideful people and always been strong and about who we are. So, like you said, we don't true. need to change that at all. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, man, like, you know, I know we're going to time constraints, but I was saying, like, good. you know, like, when you start traveling and stuff like that and learning the history, man, there's not, there's not too many continents or too many countries that you're not going to find black people in. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna, the indigenous people, you're going to find yeah. black people everywhere. I took a trip to Cuba in 2017, and, you know, I already knew there was black people over there, but when I went there, I'm talking about black as night, speaking Spanish, but it was like, you know, they knew their history. They knew, like, you know, the slave blood they had into them. Like, all around the Caribbean, you see, like, you know, they, when they really know their history, they understand, like, you know, the slave blood that came there. So it's like, you got to be proud for of it. And the thing is, too, for me traveling, I learned that you'll find more people really proud of blackness on other countries than they find it right here. And I mean, of course, we had different scenarios, but again, for African Americans, we definitely have to get back to like, you know, really just being proud for who we are, where we came from. So for sure. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's, uh, that's really why we wanted to have these conversations that basically uh, that's part of what our uh, organization does. Like we want to instill that pridefulness and just that change of mindset that, you know, Black is beautiful and, and it's always been beautiful and just, right. just embrace it and don't worry about what anybody else has to say about it because uh, we got each other. We got our back. So True. thank you for, for that, man, for what you do. So, uh, yeah, uh, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you do about the Maasai Network and Pan-African Beauty Supply. Tell us a little bit about that. Cool. So uh, basically, I saw a need for, man, I think about five years ago, I started seeing people kind of like getting back to like, trying to get back to their roots, trying to get back to like, you know, being natural, things like that. And if you think about it, when you go to the beauty spot stores, I always saw that there's people in there that own a beauty spot store and they, they sell our products that come from our land, but they really can't tell you anything about it. Like I can ask one of them like, oh, hey, what, what's the shape brother do? They can't, they can tell you like, oh, it's good for your skin, but they re really can't tell you because they don't really use those products. You know what I'm saying? I was like, man, I saw a need for just something that's for us. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so the name came from my, one of my famous leaders, uh, Marcus Garvey, the Pan-African Movement. And he had a movement in 1920s and 30s about back to Africa. He was like, you know, Africans need to be like this pride of who they are and get back to our roots. So from there, I was like, you know, I want to have something where people might not be able to actually go to Africa, but at least they can get something that's for their roots and, that you know, is in, embrace who they are. So I was like, you know, I'm going to start off and I'm going to get, like, you know, just figure out something like that. So that's where the thing came from. The Messiah Network that's more of like a, a documentary series I do. So I made a documentary that was like, you know, about uplifting the black community. And I was uh, interviewing people from like community leaders to teachers to uh, just all different people in the community. So I do, uh, I've been in a lot of film festivals. We've been doing really good on like the West Coast. I've been like two film festivals on the California region, but I'm really proudful of uh, this Pan-African movement. I love everything that's going on with it, you know? So, yeah. How has your Maasai network been accepted? Or how is that going? Oh, everything's good with it. You know, uh, the documentary did pretty good. Um, it was my first road documentary, too, so it was like a raw, just like, you know, this interviews with people and just like, you know, talking to different people on different levels. So, you know, and also, too, one of my friends, she was in Germany, and she talked to a Black person over there about what Black Lives Matter means to him. So we got a different viewpoint of it where you can see, like, okay, German Black, but he got to see kind of like, you know, his intake on what Africans got going on over here. Because, again, a lot of people see stuff on TV, but they don't really know what African Americans and over here got going through they like they see like you know they might not really truly understand what's going on over here you know you you'll find it too if you meet some africans a lot of africans when they come over here they might not understand like you know some of the prejudice that we have or some of like you know how we feel about certain things because they, they didn't go through what we went through so they have to really understand that but again they're kind of lost because they be like you know oh we might be a little different to us but at the end of the day you're gonna be treated just like any other black person over here so you know the network been really going good but i definitely like you know everything. But right now, I'm really pushing the Pan-African um, view supply and, you know, just getting everybody back to their roots so they can get just raw products, 100% raw. Okay, cool. So uh, you said you saw a need and you saw people were getting back in. So how did you get into it? Like, what made you motivate? What motivated you about, you know what, I'm finna provide this for the people. Like, what, what was it in your oh, head that did it for you? Got you. So for me, it was... Um, I grew up in a household with uh, my mom and my sister. Uh, I have my grandmas. Everybody always did hair. So I've been around, like, you know, the black hair, like, everything like that. So I always had, like, a sense of, like, you know, just what it was. And when I started seeing people, again, going more natural and not wanting all, that, all them 
you know, just the pro the products and they wanted more raw products. I was like, you know, I really like it. Love this whole just like embrace my whole self. I feel good about it. You know, when I start seeing my friends going from having lotion to just wearing shea butter now, I, uh, instead of like wearing Dove soap, they wearing like, you know my African soap. I love seeing that because again, it's like you know we embracing our whole self. So I always kind of been like that, but for me, I really got into when I started like just really going into like the whole Pan African movement and the Marcus Garvey movement. I was like, you know, this is what this is where I'm at right now. So I started embracing it. And then everything changed for me, too. I started going from, like, you know, loving design to, like, you know, you pushing me in dashiki or something like that. Or just, like, you know, black-owned, stuff like that. I started pushing that more, you know. Because, again, it's a change-up when I start seeing, like, okay, how we walk into a Louis Vuitton store and value that is the same way I'll walk into, you know, when I buy, like, my black-owned shirt, something like that. You know what I'm saying? I always I produce it the same way. I feel comfortable with it, too. And it's when you get to that level of, like, when you respect it and when you pride for of it, it's a whole different level when you wear a black-owned shirt, like how you got right there in the back. And you, this is oh, yeah. on the same level. Yeah, and you got this and you're on the same level. Like, you know, I got that um, Black My Popular Man shirt. I wear a lot of those. And I right. wear that. And I'm just like, hey, this is, you no, know, it's design too. But it's the black design. I'm, it's a sense of pride for me. I love, you know what I'm saying, wearing it. It's like, hey, this is, you know, on the same level as Louis to me because it's black owned. It makes me feel good wearing it. So that's why I always, you know, just being prideful of that. So I really push that. So basically it was more of an appreciation that you came into. Yeah, appreciate it, yeah. Of my blackness, yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. Sure. Uh you know, well my name, Jelani, is, is Swahili. So I've always had an appreciation for the African uh in me. So I, I can appreciate you, brother, for saying that because uh like you said, it, it, it gives you pride when you see others, you know, mm -hmm. actually embrace that and, and it's good that you for for you know that, that, that you're pushing that and that you're 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 uh you're promoting that and uh your business uh uh, seems to align with with your thoughts, so that, that that's cool, man. Of course, and that's a, and that's a big thing too, man. You want to be like, you know, when you see somebody and they're talking like, um, you know, all these uplifting things and great words on social media. When you see them, you want to make sure they have the same kind of actions. You know what I'm saying? You want to make sure your actions align with your words. So when people see me, they be like, okay, well, I see what you're doing. It's the same thing that you know I see on social media, anything like that. You know, Cause I started doing my stuff in the community work. Like I've been a teacher. For five years now in Dallas ISD, okay. so I always been like that, and part of a mentorship program too called Sadie Hand. So I was always like in the community. I feel like you know my biggest thing is like getting back to the community um, in any way. It's always gonna be with the youth. You know what I'm saying? Like the youth is yeah. gonna that's, that's where it is. So I always like you know just target that. Even when I got, I never forgot offer a job in like Frisco area, and I was like, man, I just couldn't do it because I knew where my heart is. It's, it's right here, you know, in Dallas. I had to go, I had to stay right here. So I'm all about, you know, getting back to the youth. So, again, I'm yeah. real this impactful right there. And then against Frisco, uh, to your point, it was yeah, just that, yeah. where you were and where exactly. your heart was. You, It was a need that you saw exactly. that you could fit into. So, yeah, man, I sure. appreciate that, brother. Uh, For sure. Yeah, another thing. So with uh, with your business and uh, – with the quarantine and this pandemic going on, has how has the coronavirus affected your your movement, your your business? Uh, how is that? Uh, uh, excuse me, pardon me. How has that affected your right? business? Yeah. Uh, All right, man, I'm be, I'm gonna be real with you. So in the beginning, I didn't take the coronavirus serious at first. I'm not, I ain't gonna lie to you. I was like, dang, I don't think it's gonna be, you know, all that. And now, and now I have some nurse friends too who I, you know, and they was kind of, they wasn't telling me too much either. So I was kind of like, ugh, I don't take it serious. But when they started saying they're going to close down my, my job, I work at a school, they're going to close down my school. And I was like, okay. And I started seeing people really get like, you know, sick and things like that. I was like, okay, well, this might be serious. So my um, pet African beauty spot only been in business for right about five months. I was nervous. I was like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. People ain't going to be shopping. So what I did is this I didn't panic. And this is a good thing about being black too. We have always been able to adapt and adjust. I went back to the drawing boards and I literally looked at the statistics and I was like, okay, people are going to be online for like if you look at the numbers, they online for like roughly five hours more than they used to be on the phones and social media like that. So went to the drawing boards. I invested some money. I went to Facebook ads. I got some uh, ads going for my business and targeting people that I knew bought you know organic products. And then I started posting more on my uh, on both pages. I was like, you know, every day around like two o'clock. And around five o'clock, around seven, I want to post and make sure people see what's going on. So I went to drawing boards, man, and I've been blessed that everything has really been, you know, going pretty good. And also, too, it kind of been a blessing in disguise because when we look at the whole what's going on right now, you see people like, okay, I want to get out of, you know, 
I want to start eating healthier and no more pro uh, like no more stuff that's like pretty like what must I say? Process. No more like phase stuff, process. That's what I'm looking for. My fault. No more process okay. stuff. And then so when it goes from that, it goes over to like, you know, what they put in their body, what they use in their body. And it was like, you know, I'm seeing people asking me, like, okay, I want to get some more like, you know, raw soap, nothing processed. I want to get some, you know, everything from soap to toothpaste to body wash. So I was like, hey, I'm, to, I'm sending stuff out everywhere. So I've been like, you know, it's been a blessing in disguise. And it really made me like, you know, understand this. When adversity comes, you have to be able to handle that. And our people have been beautiful with handling everything from the beginning of time and any kind of adversity. So for me, I was like, you know, I just went to the drawing boards. And I was like, I'm going to figure out how to do this. But it's been, it's been pretty good. I've been everything been steady. I'm glad I'm online owning, so I don't got to worry about, you know, opening up the doors and things like that. But as I but I was actually looking for a place like either North Dallas or Richardson area. So that's been put on hold. But the online stuff has been going really good, man. I've just been happy with it. But like I said, I went to drawing boards and had to adapt. And that's for any that's – that's like for any entrepreneur that's young um, or that's just starting a business, understand this, that, you know, you're going to have – troubles in it but you have to have a real love for it because let's say i was selling something that i didn't necessarily love then when i wasn't getting sales i'm making money then i'm gonna be like man i, ain't, I don't really want to know if i want to do this like you see it all the time we see people like you know i'm gonna start clothing line or something like that and then when things don't go right they you know you don't ever hear anything about it no more for me i don't care if i make a hundred dollars a day i'll make 27 dollars a day i'm gonna still have the same love for it i'm gonna still post for it i'm gonna still you know push my african movement and you're going to see the same energy from me on a good day and a bad day because it's all about learning. So you got to have that real thing. If you'd be awesome in order to have a real business, you have to understand that it doesn't matter if it's, you know, what's the sales going on, just take it and adapt and adjust and go back to the drawing board at all times. That's cool, man. You just pull from the ancestors, look like. Yeah. You pull from yeah, what we yeah. already had up in you. Got to. Yeah, yeah. man. So, hey, man, congratulations on your store and everything, man. Uh, we got one more question before we get you up out of here. Got you. So how do you think what you do or your business, how do you think that could benefit uh, the entire black community? So for me, it's a sense of pride when I get it. Um, I have had, um, when I read the reviews, people would tell me like, you know, I, I recently changed from this soap into using your African soap. And I feel it's like it's a sense of pride. Like, you know, me, I have my home girl. She was telling me the other day how she doesn't use soap. I mean, uh, doesn't use lotion anymore. She's just all shea butter. And, you know, since the problem when you know the region that it comes from, you know, your roots, and you know, you're wearing the same thing as your forefathers or four ancestors were. And it's like, for me, I'm like, you know, I think we're always going to be around because as long as the people have a need and a, a need for raw products and a, need, uh, a sense of like pride in their self and unity, then I think my, I think Pan Africa always going to be around. So I'm really proud for what I did. It wasn't a thing for like, you know, a fab or anything like that or anything new. It was more like I wanted to start it for the people, for the community. You know, because we have a lot of black love going on right now. So I think it's really good for us. Okay. Well, yeah, man, I do uh, I do appreciate that. I think that there will always be uh, an avenue or or, or uh, a lane for African pride. So anybody that's on that, I think, is always going to win, especially if you're pushing it from your soul. If you're really, mm -hmm. you really feeling it and, like, you, you're, like you said, you're knowledgeable. You know where Shea Butter come from exactly. the benefits of it the black soap all that so and it's just all about supporting black businesses so man i for appreciate sure. you man for um, sure. and that's and that's right like i said man you um last thing or fast because like you know you have to really like be knowledgeable you have to have a love for it too you know what i'm saying you know when you run a car salesman here you know he's just trying to sell you something real fast and then you can tell that people who really like you know love what they're doing so for me i just make sure that people understand that this is going from my heart and when you get this product, it's really coming from, like, you know, it's me. I, I'm just giving it to you, and I love the reviews I get. So, you know, I'm always about just, like, pushing it out there and uh, getting the reviews. And I specialize on professionalism. I want to make sure I have a good customer service and make sure that the orders get there fast. Because, again, you know, online, you want to get there, like, you know, as fast as you can. So, them are three things I always, like, try to just push, like, make sure it's professional and make sure the customer service is good. And, you know, that it's a black-owned, but, you know, it's getting money back to the community. So, Cool, sure. man. Everybody support your black businesses, man. So, Before you get out so. here, uh, drop your tags, man. Let everybody know where they can get your products, at, uh, the Messiah Network and everything. Let everybody know that. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to tag it on. It's my first time being on live, so I don't know how you do it. But I'm going to tag it on. I'm going to post it in the name. Yeah, but, when you uh, post basically, it. Basically, yeah. okay. It's at, um, at Pan African Beauty Supply on Instagram. Uh, and, of course, we got Facebook Shop, too, the same name. Messiah Network is on the same. Uh, it's on my same page on the little link. And I'm going to tag everything in here. Again, it's my first time being on uh, Facebook Live. I didn't know how to do it, but I tag everything. Yeah, all you got to do is just, like you said, tag it. And uh, 
I can post it on like pin it to the uh, to the conversation so everybody For sure. can see it. For sure. All right. Hey Ramir, I appreciate the time, brother. Uh appreciate your information, man. We appreciate no you coming through and dropping these gems and uh hey man, anytime, man. We'll get you back on here and uh see what's going on. I appreciate it, man. You say All strong. Right. Take All it right. easy, bro. You too. All right. All right, so that was Ramil Shabazz Parks of Pan African Beauty Supply, uh, letting us know about his business, about how he got into it, about his pride of uh, African people. So, uh, yeah, man. So he, he's gonna put his uh, his information out here, and we'll be waiting on the next guest that's coming up. We have the educator out of Chicago, Illinois. Mr. Donald Bailey, he's about to come on. Dog, what's up? What's going on, team? Chilling, man. I just told everybody what your name was, really, but uh, you go ahead and do the proper introduction, sir. My name is Donald Bailey. Um, you want me to say where I work? Yeah, do I, I work uh, for Regeneration Schools, Washington Park, located on 61st in Indiana. I'm a dean of students. What city? Chicago, Illinois. Chicago, Born Illinois. Raised, all the way, yeah. That's the dean of students. All right, brothers. So uh, we're going to get into it with the first question we like to ask our panelists, man. Uh, what is it like or what do you feel about being black? Whoa. Or what do you um, even think that means? Yeah. Well, you know... I remember watching a, a, a television series with Chris Rock, and he stated that he lives on a block. He lives next to Oprah and Jay-Z. He said, Oprah, arguably the best uh, television host in the world. He said, uh, Jay-Z, arguably the best rapper in the world. And then he said, you get him, who is possibly the best comedian, arguably the best comedian in the world. And he said his direct neighbor is a dentist. <laughs> so yeah. with that being said, with that being said, you know, being black is being the best. It's not for me, you know, it's 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 it's, it's being smarter and running faster than my opponent so that I can make sure that I'm giving the race a, a um a great representation of what it is to be black. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like a competition at all times and just trying to be your best. So being black is, is is basically a challenge for you. Like I'm I'm going at it. Like, this oh, is yeah. what it is. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, you gotta you gotta watch what you say, how you move, and you know, again, I I I was watching the other one that you had and you said it's unapologetically doing things. You know, yeah, I do have that sense of pride, but I also want to make sure that I'm not pushing the race three steps backwards as well. So, you know, coming being well spoken and well read and educated. These are the things that I add to, get to my utility belt, you know, when I'm out here in the world, yeah. representing myself as well as the black race. Right. Well, those things are being black. Like, you know, I mean, you know, speaking well or whatever, like education, educated yeah. is black. Like we were the first educators. We were the first teachers. So that's in our DNA. And that's, that's proven as history. That's not, I'm not just talking. That ain't how I feel. That's real. Right. So yeah, when you speak to that, that when you say I have to keep that in mind when I'm out there, that all you're doing is keeping in line with what you are, what you keeping are in line. Right. Exactly, exactly. Because yeah, yeah. uh, when I was getting my masters, they kept wanting me to write, and they were like, you know, um, about education. If you look at the timeline, it starts in Jamestown. So every time I would submit James. a paper, it was like, no, it's not Jamestown. The Moors were the first ones to be selling. So I would always put make sure that I put the real knowledge in there as well as their knowledge too because they're going to start you from Jamestown I believe 1792 but that's not where yeah. it started the, Mar the Moroccans been traveling the world you know they conquered Spain for over 500 years so that's just being knowledgeable uh, and being able to pull that off of my utility belt so it, yeah and, and you speaking to the Moroccans a lot of people don't well I didn't know to my line brother uh, Andre Lee taught me that the Moroc uh, Morocco was the first nation to even recognize America as a country. Mm. They were the first nation. A black yeah. nation was the first nation to ever recognize America as a country. So the Moroccans were ahead of the game 
in so many levels. So Dope. yes, brother, appreciate you bringing Morocco into the conversation. Uh, get back into it. So you're a teacher, dean of students. Uh, how did you get into that, man? What motivated you to be an educator? Well, you know, uh, you and I both come from those humble beginnings, youth villages. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to 2266, 2266, I believe. That's right. what they were paying in the beginning. I so so drop them off. So, so take them back because a lot of people don't know what Youth Villages is. Take, take them back to what Youth Villages is. So. Oh, youth, youth Villages is located in Memphis, Tennessee. And it, it kind of became like a pipeline between Russ College and Youth Villages to get the, the people in, to give us our, our first jobs out of college. And yeah. um, coming straight out of college, they wanted to give you $22,660, $22,660 a year. And you yeah. took it, you know, because you didn't know any better. But, you know, I have nothing bad to say. It, it was a great experience. But while working at Youth Villages, I was managing behaviors on a regular. Um, superseded. So, yeah, in, hold on. So, so I don't think we didn't tell them what Youth Villages was, actually. Memphis, Tennessee, what, which one? No, no. What, what is Youth Villages? What? Oh, you, what is Youth Villages? Yeah, because, you know, a lot of people don't know what Youth Villages is. Just okay. me and you, probably. Yeah. Hold on. Are you saying what it is or where it is? What? Okay, so Youth Villages is a boys and girls home. Well, I, I stayed on a, a campus. It's a campus, and they also have group homes that deals with at-risk youth. So the kids who run away from home may be in the, um, in the system seeking, um, seeking uh, support or want, want to be adopted. Uh, I, I had the privilege of dealing with the problem sexual behavior of children. Those were kids who had been molested, may have molested someone. Um, and yeah, so that's what I did. I managed those behaviors on a day-to-day -day basis. I like how you said privilege. Yeah, it was a privilege. Yeah, it was a privilege, privilege to work with your kids. Because yeah. move, moving from Jelani, moving from uh, youth villages, it gave me that cushion and foundation to feel like these, these, uh, nobody else, it could be worse, you know, like some of those kids came from a very troubled background and, you know, they would come, you would come to work and they would attempt to fight you and harm you on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, building that relationship with those kids and being able to, I, 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 I love to say, talk a cat out of a tree, being able to talk that kid from ready to self-harm or harm you back to his baseline or where he's calm, uh, compliant, loving you know that was a privilege to 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 learn you know to learn how to do such a thing okay and so this is what your that you villages is what motivated you to get into the public school system correct correct so working with youth villages i i i left youth villages i want to say in 2012 uh moved back to chicago uh and i got into the chicago public school system um and i just worked my way around the chicago public school system helping the kids uh, until I got the phone call from Regeneration Schools, which is a charter school, uh, and they offered me the dean position. I went out, looked at the school. They had a beautiful, uh, they, they, the kids were beautiful, uh, no problems. And I was like, well, yes, I would love to be the dean of this school. Um, and from, um, that's where I am now. Cool, man. So you're the dean of a uh, Regeneration School. You said that's a charter school, right? Charter school, correct. What, what grades do you say? Is it high school? Middle school, so I'm fifth to eighth. Fifth to yep. eighth. Okay, okay. How long y'all been around? Uh, I don't know the number right off the bat. How long you been there? I've been there for probably five years now. Five years. Okay, cool, yeah. cool, cool. All right, bet, man. I appreciate you working in the community, and uh, thank you for taking time with the children. I used to be a teacher, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a calling, man. You just can't – there ain't no job. Like, you can't just – you got to want to go and you want to yeah. be there for them kids, man. So I uh, appreciate your, 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 uh, your dedication to the community and to the children, man, of, of our future. Uh, with everything going on now in your business and your line of work, uh, how has the coronavirus affected that at all? Um, well, you know, they shut down the schools. So yeah. a lot of our kids are doing um, at home work. Um, to where they're learning online, they're talking to the teachers, we're meeting with them on a daily, uh, we're calling them on a daily basis, checking in with them, uh, making sure that they have the tools that they need in order to have a seat at the table. 
Okay, cool. So uh, with the coronavirus, y'all basically have gone towards uh, uh, online with everything now. Correct. And it basically has worked out so so fine. So I have a question uh, because you have a you have a uh, a unique ex a unique uh, take on this as an educator and as a parent of school age children. How do you feel about uh, schools opening up? Like, what do you foresee schools doing in the fall? Like, what 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 what, what, what do you see? And then I want to know how do you feel about it? Well. So I'm, I'm going to tell you how I feel, then I'm going to tell you what I see. I do that. Right. And I'm going to tell you a story real quick. It's not fast. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a flood. It was a flood being told and said in five days, we will get incessant rain and the world will be wiped out. So the Dalai Lama went to the Buddhists and he told the Buddhists, hey, I need you to meditate and prepare for reincarnation. The Pope went to the Catholics and he said, I need you to confess your sins and pray. The chief rabbi of Israel goes on television and tells the people, we have to find out how to live underwater in five days. So I tell you that story because this is where we are right now as a country, right? It's not, we have to figure out how to live underwater hmm. right now. We are underwater. Hmm. The COVID is the water, you know? But how I feel, I feel like, you know, I feel I feel really well because the things that we were asking for, the seat at the table a lot of times, you know, we, we were asking for families to be able to spend more time with their children. These are things that we prayed for. People prayed for this, that they wish that they can stay home with their kids. Uh, we asked that all of our kids would be able to have a laptop and internet at their house so that they can be introduced to technology a lot more at, at a very early age. My kindergarten and my first grader have laptops because you know this is how learning is going right. but being black again going back to your first question was it to be black is to be last sometimes right we, we we're the last to get things because when you think of the suburban schools and you think of different schools they've already had laptops they've already had the internet they're being uh exposed to online learning at an early age you know so now we have that same um privilege so that's the that's how i feel in when the schools open up, I feel like we're going to be a lot, we're going to be bigger, better, and stronger. Um, I really hope that, because I, to me personally, if we do not use this time to capitalize on what we have executed, then it all goes down the drain. You know, we learned that teachers don't have to go to school every day. Uh, parents should not be working all the time. They should be home with their kids. Kids do not have to sit in the classroom We've for eight lot. hours out of the day. Uh, to get the knowledge that they need. So I'm hoping that we capitalize on what um, on what we've learned from living underwater. Do you think we're going back in the fall? Like regular regular time? Whatever uh, after Labor Day you think is going to be like opened up? Just from what you think, you know, from what you see right now. Uh, they're opening up a lot of businesses and stores now. So, you know, you just don't know it. They may open it up, you know. They're, 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 gonna, they're, they're definitely going to put a lot of red tape in place, I believe. Um, you know, everyone might have to get vaccinated. You may have to get vaccinated before you go to work. As a scholar, you may have to get vaccinated before you come back to school. So these are things that, that will be put in place. You're going to have to probably wear masks. Classroom sizes might be short. Remember, a lot of teachers yeah. used to complain about that. A lot of yep. teachers was in the classroom with 30, 40 kids, and they were saying it was overwhelming. Not so now it might, it might go down to 20 kids in the classroom or 15. So, you know, I definitely believe that we're going to capitalize off of what we've learned from this. All right, cool, man. Appreciate that. So how do you uh, – so one more question, man. How do you think, you know, what you do or, or your business or anything that you do can help uh, enrich and inform the black community? Well, just just um, being black is doing a lot. <laughs> uh, being a positive role model is being doing a lot as well. Um, watching what I do, how I move does a lot. It gives that image to the kids who are growing up. Moving back to the neighborhood that I grew up in does a lot because the kids not only see that, okay, this guy went away to school, he came back, and we can see the fruits of, 
um, from his tree. You know, we can ask him for that advice and being that staple in the community. I um, also work with the Brilliant Brown Boy Book Club. Uh, we used to meet at Bexie Ross Library uh, on 61st and King Drive, I want to say, um, or 60th and King is somewhere up in that area. Uh, and this was spearheaded by Chad Smith. Um, and again, we've given those kids that access to books of kids of our color. Um, and so therefore they're reading about themselves. It's not uh, uh, a thing of, well, I never see me on the news. Or, well, only time I see me on television is if we're doing something wrong. Or the right. only time I see me in a book is if I'm a slave or, if, you know, but it's putting us at, at a better light. Um, so I think this is these are the things that we must continue to do in order to keep these kids motivated, educated, and dedicated to wanting to be someone. Like, like books like this? Uh, yes, sir. About your line. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. But uh, Daddy is born. Those type yeah. of books. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think this is a good book to uh, to get for that. Uh, what you say? The brilliant, uh, brilliant brown, brilliant boy book brown club. boy book club. Yeah. Yeah. Tell tell people about that right quick, man. Again, uh, so every Saturday we would meet up and we would meet with a selective group. And all all young men were uh, able to join. Uh, but whoever showed up, we would read books of color to those scholars, uh, black authors, black characters, black illustrators. Uh, and it just basically, shout out to Ponji. Um, she, she, her sons read a, read a few books that we were able to read. Um, but yeah, it basically put those kids, we, the goal is to make reading something fun. Back in the day, you know, you want punishment, go read a book. But now we, what we want to do is we want to introduce reading and open it up to kids to where it's something to be enjoyed opposed to being a punishment. All right. And you use uh, familiar characters and characters yeah. that they can recognize and, 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 uh, and actually uh, relate to. Exactly. To pass that, pass that, me that message on. Cool, huh. man. Cool, cool, cool. Well, I appreciate that, brother. Uh, before you get out of here, you want to drop your brown boy, brilliant brown boy book tag? Like, is there a website or something? Well, you can, uh, I'll drop it in the, um, in the comments. Is there someone yeah, else coming on or? No, no, no. You can ask one. Oh, oh, okay. So yeah, I have to. So www.brilliantbrownboy.com. Brilliant brown boy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So. And you can drop it when you get off, man, if you want to. Like, I, You're going to stay I'm, on? I'm, yeah, I'm going to stay on for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Brilliantbrownboy.com. Okay, man. Well, dog, I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you coming through and sharing your time, sharing your info. Well, um, I appreciate you for having me, man. Oh, yeah, man, brother. Thank you, man. We, we got to get uh, we got to get our voices out here, man, our messages out here to the people, man, because, hey, we need to hear it. So thank exactly. you, man. Appreciate exactly. it, bro. All right. Anytime. All right. Love you, bro. I see, I, I see you in a minute. Love you. <laughs> All right, dog. All right, that was the brother, Donald Bailey, out of Chicago, Illinois, dean of students at Regeneration School, at Regeneration School in uh, Washington Parks in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Hope I said that right. And as you see, we have the brilliant brown, brilliant brown, club at gmail.com Dre the CEO has just dropped that on the comments so if you want any more information about that look at brilliantbrownclub.com uh, today we had two guests Ramil Shabazz Parks of Pan African Beauty Supply and uh, the Messiah Network and also Donald Bailey educated out of Chicago Illinois uh, basically both brothers were talking about community relations and you know, being proud of who you are as a people, of, of, as of an African people, and just the relations we have to each other and what it meant to them to be Black. Uh, what I got from them was strong, I mean, strength, resilience, uh, dedication, challenges, and just overall pride and beauty. So uh, we're going to keep pushing these messages. 
keep giving these positive images, man. That's what Black to Life is here for. That's what these conversations are here uh, for, to enrich and to inform. And uh, we appreciate you joining us. This was just this one-off. Uh, this was a one-off uh, night. Hey, Tanya, appreciate that. This is a one-off night, Wednesday nights. It's usually on, our kickbacks are on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. And uh, we'll be back to our reg regularly scheduled uh, time next week. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hope you uh, enjoyed our guests and the information that was passed along. And we'll see y'all next week, man. Appreciate that.